Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm Kent Rourke. Thanks for coming back and watching uh, another episode. Uh, tonight, we're going to be featuring Dragon. So again, I want to thank Don Varnell for writing that song and the POA uh, youth that performed it in 2010. I think it's catchy, and uh, I'm humming it all the time right when I'm getting ready, uh, downloading pictures. We have about 70-some pictures to go through tonight about Dragon. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any sponsors tonight. If you'd like to sponsor, uh, it's pretty reasonable uh, for a Supreme uh, sponsorship. It's only $50, and if you've watched the other episodes, I've had... Uh, I'll only, I limit it to two so we don't overwhelm with sponsorships, but I talk for a little while in the middle of the show and I mention your farm name or, or your stallion or whoever you want to sponsor. And then uh, we have an ROM sponsor, a play on the championships, you know, for POAs. That's only $20 and that'll get you one picture and just the name drop. I won't go on to into a story, lengthy story about the horse or anything, but if you want to shout out a pony rider combination or a newborn foal or an old stallion or whoever want to put a picture of your grandma who got you into POAs uh, and I'll just give a shout out $20 is pretty cheap and it goes uh, just to buy swag I'm going to be in Tulsa handing out some swag uh, trying to advertise for POAs and the history of POA to keep it going so uh, of course, this is mainly POA history, but we do talk about modern stuff, too. Uh, if you want to be a guest on the show, please uh, just let me know. We can do a Zoom or anything like that or Google chat, whatever, or we can do uh, just a, a phone interview. That seems to work pretty well, too. So uh, let me get into some pictures tonight. And uh, that's old. Uh, that's him right there. That's Dragon. So let me make sure my pictures are working good here. Let's see. Here we go. Doo, doo, doo. So I'm having some technical difficulties again. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to start talking about Dragon. So Dragon's a cool story. You know, we went through Black Hand was number one, Siri Chief number two, and then uh, number um, 17 was... Corrett Scottish Chieftain, number 18, actually, and now we're on number 103, and 103 is Dragon. And Dragon actually could have been number 60, but they waited to register him to 103, and I'll have the story of that, uh, why they waited so long. There we go. All right. Again, my uh, technical advisor, Shane, bailed me out, so... <laughs> So I do want to thank Jackson's Auto Family. Uh, you're going to be in Tulsa this summer for a whole week at the national show. If you need any uh, service needs on your Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, run over to Enid. It's about an hour and a half from Tulsa. Or if you're looking for a vehicle, look us up. We've sold vehicles uh, myself personally to California, New Mexico, Minnesota, Louisiana, Arizona, all over the place. So Colorado, uh, some cool stories about people coming here and picking up vehicles, and sometimes we deliver them too. We'll just ship them to you. Uh, so, and uh, we'll we can do what any Chrysler Dodge Jeep dealer in America can do. So check out Jackson's Auto Family, JacksonsAvena.com. So let's get back to Dragon now. I know he don't look the greatest in this picture, but you gotta remember his story. Uh, reportedly, he was born in 1946. We don't know for sure, but that's what most historians say is 46. Uh, of course, if you don't know the dragon story, uh, he became a legend and he outlived his legend. You know, his legend became bigger than he ever was uh, as a sire or anything like that. But he still, as you'll see in the 70 some pictures tonight, he made his mark on POAs too as a sire. Uh, but he was born in Mexico and uh, he used to, he became pretty famous as this loud colored spotted little pony. He wasn't very big and he had a herd of Mustangs that he was the leader of. He worked his way up and uh, he looked like a leader of Mustangs. I mean, he had a big heavy neck and just a stout little pony. And uh, over inbreeding all those years, they became shorter and shorter until they became POA size. Of course, he was born, he predates POA as being born in 46. So by the time Black Ann was born in 54, he was an aged stallion with his own herd, old uh, dragon was in Mexico. So how he got his name was he would winter his herd in a place called uh, Cavernous de los Dragonus. And in English, that just translates to Den of the Dragons. And that's pretty cool, Den of the Dragons. And uh, that's how people started calling him Dragon. 
And like I say, he became pretty famous and pretty infamous too because he was running around with his big herd and he would go into ranches and farms and he wasn't really welcome. If you can imagine a herd of Mustangs, what they could tear up in one night, uh, farmers' crops and in their fields. So there's a bounty was placed on Dragon and his herd and eventually he was captured. And uh, a ranch in Mexico had him pinned up with all his uh, mares. And the Dunn brothers from northern Texas up by Dallas, CJ and Alice Dunn, heard about this pony. And they also heard about this new pony breed, spotted pony breed, that started in Mason City, Iowa. So the Dunn's made a trip to Mexico in 1957, and they found where Dragon was. And uh, they bought, I believe, 26 horses or it was a herd of them it might have been more than that it might have been 40 some but where i'm getting the 26 is because they paid 26 american dollars for dragon in 1957 and of course he wasn't he was just a spotted pony and uh, there's some stories that he was being ridden when they found him on the ranch they weren't treating him very well he wasn't a celebrity he was an outlaw basically you know people didn't like that wild mustang stallion but in america he was about to make a big name for himself so the Duns brought him to America, to Texas, and he started raising uh, POAs. Of course, he was bred to a lot of the group that he was brought with, all those mares. And here's an interesting story. This is a picture of Dragon here as he's older, but the story of Dragon is, you know, most of the mares that were registered were probably his daughters. That's what we figure, or granddaughters. They were related to him. So he kept breeding his own bloodlines at first. Eventually, people started outcrossing him to other things, and that helped the bloodline a great deal. Uh, but the, the funny thing is, is the Dunn brothers named everything Dee Dee, as you can tell by their farm here, Dee Dee Ranch in Texas. And so number 60 was registered Dee Dee Lady number one. And then they registered like 20 or 30 Dee Dee Ladies. They slipped a few Colts in there that was with the group, and then they were Dee Dee something else. And then they waited all the way to 103 to register Dragon. Now, like in the quarter horses, if you think of Joe Reed P3 or King P243, I mean, that's how the old timers say their names. And that's when I got into POAs as a kid in the early 80s, my family. That's how people would talk about uh, Black Ann number one, Siri Chief number two, and they'd say Dragon 103. Everybody, it seems like, called him Dragon 103. In reality, his registered number, this is a history quiz for you here, uh, his real name was Dragon number 44, and then registration number 103. But no one ever referred to him as Dragon number 44. It's just that's the number that they proceeded in. They na named him almost just like business. You know, every one they registered had a number after it before their actual POA number. So after the Duns used him for quite a while, and a lot of people in Texas and all over bred to him, they started out crossing bigger horses to him because he was so small. Uh, they sold him, the Duns sold him to the Hunts of Fairfield, Iowa. And this is one of the Hunts' children on him. Now, the Hunts had some early day POAs, uh, really early, like the, in the 20s and the 40s. Uh, they actually had Apache Chief, who was number four. He sired Apache Chief Brave, number 13, who became a grand champion uh, stallion. But anyway, the first grand champion stallion was Apache Brave. So it was a good fit for the Hunts to get Dragon. He was already, the Mexican story was well known across the United States, and he just fit going up to Iowa. And they had him for quite a while, and they trained him for performance. He actually won as an older stallion at the national show, which is the Congress now, the international show. Uh, he won some performance classes uh, when he was ridden by the Hunts kids. Here's a pretty cool picture here. I like the station wagon in the back with the, the pole trailer, but this is the Hunt family with a few friends of theirs too, uh, some of the kids' friends, but this is uh, their children. And uh, again, they were from Fairfield, Iowa. So they used him in Iowa for quite a while. When the POAs started changing and going to 54 and stuff, the Hunts made a decision to stop raising POAs. They sold a lot of their, all their POAs and Dragon was one of them. So he was consigned to the international sale. And uh, there's a good shot of Dragon. That one's not seen uh, as much as some of the shots. I want Tracy to comment on this because they say he's got liver spots. Tracy's always commenting about color. So you don't see that listed anymore. You say liver chestnut, of course, 
But uh, here are these liver spots, and they have them listed at 51 and a quarter. Or just think of a wild stallion running loose, free range in, in Mexico with a bunch of mares, and he's only 51 and a quarter. Uh, so here's his pedigree when uh, the Hunts decided to put him in the national sale. He was lot number 88, hip number back then they called it 88. I thought this was kind of cool. Now here they list him at 50 and a half. Uh, maybe he shrunk by then. This would have been like 63, I think. Um, you can see fold in 46, but it's kind of funny to see a pedigree where it says Mexican Appaloosa stud and Mexican Appaloosa mare. Of course, those were Mustangs. So uh, he was purchased by these three gentlemen who formed a little syndicate. These were all Michigan people, a couple of them very well known. James Bicknell III is at the halter there. He was the president of the POA club in the mid-60s. Uh, he had midship POAs. And then the man on the far uh, right is Dr. Armstrong. He had Oak Shadows POA Farm in Michigan. He later bought uh, Kootenai's Wee Willie. And uh, that Oak Shadows, I know there's some people watching tonight that will remember that prefix. And uh, they raised POAs for quite a while. The man in the middle, I never uh, knew him. I believe his name's Harold Rocky. Just from history, he was one of the three uh, partners. So I'm going to go over some of the stuff here, going back again, some of the DDs. So here's a DD lady, uh, Clarita, early number, 597. And you can see all these had little different, you know, they were Mustangs. And then they came, they crossed them with, they started crossing them with other POAs. But uh, this is number 580. There just wasn't that many POAs to cross with. So they were getting crossed with other ponies. And then they started putting horse and quite a few breeders started breeding quarter horse and even thoroughbred to the dragon line just to kind of stretch it out. They knew it was so hardy that they liked it, but they wanted to improve the heads a little bit, and they wanted to kind of stretch out the performance. And they started doing that. I mean, this is a pretty good-looking POA for back in uh, that era, number 580, DD's Lady Vicky. In Oklahoma, you'd say Visai. There's a town spelled just like that. They say Visai. Uh, Max Allen was an early... A Minnesota POA breeder. Here's another early DD's lady, Eloise or whatever that. Is. Well, Dunn's again had that one. Here's an early one, uh, number 707. That's a cool number for Dragons. Billy the Kid. I don't know if Billy the Kid ever became a famous POA. I've never heard of him, but I thought this was a cool weanling shot of an own son of Dragon. Now this is one of the Dragon sons that made quite a name for himself, DD Dragon. Uh, he was an early one, Dunn Brothers product. As you can tell, he's starting to get a little more modern, loud colored. He's still kind of got that Mustang head, but his hips starting to get shaped more like they were going to be in the 60s. Now, this is early. This is the 60-yearbook, 60 so this is before predated the magazines. This is when they do one big yearbook, uh, kind of like we're doing now. Here's a son of D.D. Dragon. This is D.D. Dragon Dondi. And look at the chrome on this one, really high up there, big blanket, starting to stretch the necks out on these ponies. Still early, only 1271 registration number. D.D. Dragon Dondi made his name as the sire of Dragon Dondi Dot. I know there's people watching tonight that know Dragon Dondi Dot, um, a champion POA. And you see there the pedigree, D.D. Dragon's the grandsire. So another uh, grandson of D Dragon that became pretty famous was Coco Mo. He was a Texas product that they used as a stallion for a while. You can see he's starting to get shapely again, nice neck, kind of ties in a little better than some of the older stuff. Still under 1,000 in registration numbers. Uh, nice color, but he ended up being gilded, and uh, he was a speedster. He was in Minnesota for quite a while with the Cates family. This is Linda Cates riding him, Coco Mo. A you know, famous gilding, uh, really good, and here he's in English, but he was a really good timed events gilding. And uh, if you showed in Minnesota in the 70s, you'll remember Coco Mo. Linda was the daughter of uh, Wally and Ricky Cates, who raised the, the Cates POAs, and uh, they also owned series Silver Prince for a while. Here's another dragon offspring. I'm just going to show some of these that were owned by pretty famous POA breeders. Uh, this is the Murfelds, can sign this little one, Dragon's Little So, and she's by Sac City Sioux, so they probably call it Dragon's Little Sioux, I imagine. And she's an own daughter of Dragon, but a 61, so a little later. 
daughter of dragon. Here's a dragon uh, grand offs, grand cult, and this is Pawnee Warrior. There was three sons of dragon that didn't have the DD names, but we believe they come from Mexico, and Pawnee Warrior was one of them. I believe Navajo, Little Navajo Warrior was another, and I think Seminole Warrior. I might be wrong on the third one. Uh, but Little Navajo Warrior and Pawnee Warrior did sire some POAs that we'll talk about tonight. Here's another Son of Dragon that uh, was advertised quite a bit. Again, you're starting to see that little stock pony build there, and the heads are starting to get shaped a little better. But this is Haddon's Junior Dragon, number 1165. Here's another picture of him when he got a little older. Okay, this is a, a golden rods mare here. Like I joke around every week about the stone family. I mention the stones every week. Uh, and it just seems like it's rightfully so. So I imagine eventually when I get into some bloodlines, more newer bloodlines, I might not. But every week so far I've mentioned them. This is GR's... Uh, Dragon's Tammy. She was an own daughter of Dragon. So just like the Murfelds, and we'll show some other breeders, they had at least one daughter of Dragon. Now look at the neck on this this mare, and she became the mother of GR's Ten Grand. GR's Ten Grand is a Star Acres Firecracker son. We talked about him last week, being a Scottish chieftain grandson. Uh, so this is a great grandson of him, and then a gra own grandson of Dragon. And uh, you're getting more into the 70s now, and the more uh, large pony look, the 54-inch pony. He was a stallion for the Golden Rods for a while, and then he was uh, gilded. I seen him in person in Wisconsin at a show. I believe he became a supreme champion gilding, GR's 10 grand. He was a very pretty, done kind of color, buckskin type. Here's a daughter of his. I know the Phillips in Ohio owned her for a while. G or, uh, GR's old looky looky was her name. There again, we're getting later 70s now, more modern POA look. So here's another famous grandson of uh, Dragon. This is CSA Snapdragon. Uh, I believe this is a supreme champion, if not a real famous show POA, Snapdragon. Dragon's Chief, I don't have a picture of him, I believe, but he is a son that produced uh, quite a bit for the Dragon line. Here's another picture of CSA Snapdragon, and this is... Uh, Mary Elizabeth Douglas, who became one of the real famous kids in POAs. She showed a lot of great POAs. Rutledge's Yoka Chigger Pep, another uh, dragon relative we'll talk about later. She'll be pictured in here again. But this is, uh, this is Snapdragon. I know people remember him. And they'll also remember the Douglas family. So here's another famous breeder, Ray Peets, the Driftwoods in Spencer, Iowa. He's going to be an episode coming up here in the future. And uh, this is Driftwood's Powwow Princess, an own daughter of Dragon. So you see Goldenrods, Driftwoods, Murfelds, a lot of the breeders that were famous in the 60s and 70s, some of them went on up to the 80s even, uh, they had own daughters of Dragon. Here's another Murfeld product. This is MP's Joker Bee Creek. Uh, of course, Joker's High Tiger was used in POAs for quite a while, an own son of Joker Bee. But down on the bottom... You have that dragon's little Sue that I talked about earlier, and uh, she's the granddam of this cute little uh, colt here, Joker's, MP's Joker B Creek. And the Murfelds knew how to present them. They raised some really nice POAs. They'll be talked about a lot next week uh, when we talk about Stuart's Danny Boy and the Tomahawks. Okay, here's another son of Dragon. He was in uh, Minnesota, Avalon's Bay Beauty. I actually had some colored pictures of him that I was sent by a friend on Facebook. I apologize, I didn't get them on in time. It takes me a while to set up these shows, and uh, but I did find this one, and uh, he's actually the sire of Polly Pepper, and I know Paul uh, Gordon Cox was an early Minnesota breeder and I bred some really good ones. Uh, later on, I'll talk about some stuff in other episodes about some of their stuff and some of the pioneer breeders from Minnesota being that's where I got my start in Minnesota. Unfortunately, I didn't meet some of the early ones like Max Allen and, and Mr. Cox, but um, they, they did do a lot, you know, a lot to help POAs. You see Ludwig here from Pennsylvania bought Polly Pepper, but she was an own granddaughter of Dragon. Here's another GR's, this is GR's Joker Hand. 
Dragon's the grandsire on the bottom side, so that's another daughter of Dragon they had. And then an own son of Black Hand's a sire. And here's a Dragon's Chief. We mentioned him earlier. This is Dragon's Cherokee Bonnie. And look at who owned this one. Leslie Boomhauer, the man who created POAs. Okay, so now we get into the kind of another uh, chapter of the Dragon Saga. And this is, if people don't recognize him, he was a household name in POAs, 4J Leopard Boy. Now, 4J Leopard Boy was uh, from Hutchison, Kansas. Uh, O.J. Martins, who became a Hall of Fame legendary Appaloosa man, uh, breeder, shower, exhibitor, director, you know, he trainer. He was a famous uh, horseman, but he actually was in POAs in the late 50s and early 60s, and 4J was his prefix. We talked about prefix last week. Well, this was his. And uh, this was a stallion. He stayed a stallion for a long time. A lot of famous people, POA people owned him. I mentioned uh, Minnesota famous early people. Well, the Langleys from Minnesota had him. He became a famous uh, show POA, won quite a few classes. And uh, he also was uh, owned by the Cheeseboroughs. Anna Claire was an early director in POAs. I think she was vice president for a while, and uh, they owned the Ponds Cold Cream uh, Company, and they had a, a lot of great POAs. Pecoy's Little Chief was one of their stands, but 4J Leopard Boy was also one of their good POAs. And he became the sire of another famous Kansas POA, and this is 4E Leopard Queen. And, of course, the Denny's uh, had her for many, many years. She won the Mare Stakes uh, probably six times at least. I might be, uh, I'm not exaggerating, I might be cutting her short, but this is Jerry Denny uh, riding that great mare. Little white mare, 4E Leopard Queen. We have quite a few pictures of her. You know, looks like a little pony now, but let me tell you, back in the day, you, would, you didn't want to compete against her. She was a competitor and she won all the time. So that's the two main pictures of her. A half-brother to her, this is Boomer, and you see there, 4J Leopard Boy. He's by Little Navajo Warrior. That was a son of Dragon. So uh, Boomer became a famous POA. This is a picture of him taken out of the National Sale Catalog in his prime. And this is a picture of him when he got older, and he was owned by a lot of POA families, ridden by a lot of kids, taught a lot of kids how to show and ride. And that's Boomer. Then we have another famous POA. This one was on the West Coast for a long time. This is Bomber. And sometimes I get my boomers and my bombers mixed up, but tonight I got them straight. And uh, this young man holding him here is David Wood. David and I have uh, kind of struck up a friendship over Facebook. We've never met. He's a little generation ahead of me in POAs. By the time I got into POAs, he was aged out. I think he aged out about 78 and. uh David sent me a really good book called First Place that I believe Bob Lang, I think he had a partner on the book, but it's about uh, equestrian horsemanship and stuff, but it's based basically off of POAs. For a historian like me, it's a treasure to have in my collection, and I want to thank David tonight for sending that to me. And He sent me these colored pictures uh, of, of Bomber. Uh, him and his sister showed Bomber. He became a supreme champion. I wrote down here who... Uh, who trained him? He said, uh, let's see, Candy Felsinger was the trainer of him. And in 1971 through 73, Darcy, David's sister, rode him. And then David took over. And like he said, the best hand-me-down he could ever get. And he showed him till 78. And I know if you showed POAs in the 70s, you remember David and Bomber, and especially in California. Uh, but they made some national shows, too, and some big shows. That's a pretty good picture there. I used that for my advertising earlier today to kind of plug the podcast tonight. I hope you're enjoying this podcast. Uh, it's my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. And tonight we're talking about Dragon, who was the number 103 registered POA. He was the little Mexican Mustang that came up to America and became a household name in the Pony of the Americas. Uh, we've still got a lot to go tonight. Uh, if you want to be a guest or a sponsor, please give me a call, or you can uh, Facebook, instant message, email, however you want to get a hold of me. Uh, call me at the dealership here. I'm in Studio B tonight at Jackson's Auto Family in Enid, Oklahoma. 
Here again is another legendary POA. And uh, this is a pretty cool story here, some early day POA story. This is Salty Little Britches, if people don't recognize him. I believe that's one of the memorings holding him. Uh, he was owned by some great POA families too. And of course, I was a breeder and a historian, so I like the, the breeding aspect of it and stuff. So I want to tell the story of this gilding. Uh, Chief Little Britches was bred to I believe Miss Dragonette. I'm going to look it up to make sure I got it right. Little Dragonette. See, I messed it up. Little Dragonette, and the offspring was Miss Dragon Britches. And Lynn Puffenbarger had Miss Dragon Britches. Of course, the Puffenbarger family leafed, leased Chief Little Britches and then ended up buying him and having him for 20 some years. He died in Cherokee at 30. But uh, he took a, an early daughter, like a 60 some in the 19 mid 60s, daughter of Dragon a granddaughter of Dragon and Chief Little Britches and bred her to Piney Bar, a quarter horse. And the result was Salty Little Britches. Now, a lot of people, I remember I used to argue with famous POA people, a lot of people thought he was a son of Chief Little Britches, but he really wasn't. He was a son of Piney Bar and a grandson of Little Britches and a great-grandson of Dragon. And he won 28 international classes at the international show. I know that because he's the only POA that ever won by the AQHA Stallion Piney Bar. Here he is with Kerry Eckroat. They live just down the road from uh, where I'm sitting right now, about 20 minutes or less. That's uh, Hennessy, Oklahoma. Her dad was a board of director, Jack Eckroat. And this is young Kerry with Salty Little Bridges. Again, he won a lot of national titles. And here he is. I love this picture. He's just flying. He's got his ears pinned back. His foretop is going, and she's just a yelling. And you can imagine if that was in motion, uh, her little legs are just flapping away. Here she is again. I love this picture, the determination, doing a pull pattern. And then here's one of their many national plaques that they won. Again, he was owned by several great families and he was a, a good POA for a long time. He was born in 1967. Uh, salty Little Britches and grandson of Chief Little Britches and a great grandson of Dragon. So again we're going to start another chapter. I'm going to take a little drink of water because we're going to start talking about an important gentleman uh, in the Dragon story. A person that was around POAs for most of his adult life uh, we lost Norm Stevenson a few years ago. Uh, luckily, he came back into POAs. I mean, he never got out, but he didn't come around to a lot of national events. And Pat Burton kind of drug him back to Iowa to the sale, and uh, he started showing again, actually won the select sire for charity, started getting his horses in some good hands again. Uh, but he'd never quit raising POAs, and uh, he had a herd of them down there. He told me one time, we used to talk on the phone about once or twice a month because he just was a fountain of old knowledge on POAs and quarter horses and uh, he loved talking to me about the history of stuff and what was going to happen with POAs in the future and he just was a great breeder and loved to talk about all kinds of genetics and uh, he said as a kid he wasn't allowed to have guns or ponies and he wanted both so when he became an older gentleman he was up in his 80s he had uh, probably over a hundred horses and ponies and way more than that in a uh, collectible gun. So he got to do what he wanted to do in life. But his early start was Son of Dragon. That was his first really uh, good POA stallion. And he named his farm Dragonins. And of course, we're, we're going to talk about the Dragonins. Now, not all Dragonins today go back to Dragon. The majority of them do. Someday I need to sit down. It'd be a study. It'd be a long weekend and a bottle of something. But uh, I'd have to go and see all the, the horses, the POAs that have dragons on their prefix and uh, trace them back and see. But I imagine 80% or more do trace back to dragon. So Son of Dragon was an early POA, and uh, Norm got him in northern Texas. And uh, he had a big influence on Norm's program. This is one of the descendants here. This is, again, Mary Elizabeth Douglas that we talked about earlier, riding Snapdragon. And this here, she's on, mounted on Dragonin's Chiquita, I believe is how you say her name. She won some national titles. She was a big old POA. Her, uh, they even joked that her 
uh, Withers was 54 and her hip was 58, you know, but she, uh, she got it done. Of course she was ridden by a great rider, but she was a product from the dragon ends. And I'm just going to show some pictures. Some people might recognize some of these, but dragon ends, Danny here, dragon ends reward goes to dragons war dragon. And he's an own son of son of dragon, but, uh, Dunny starlight you see in there, uh, Norm put a lot of quarter horse breeding in his POAs and he told me he worked for years to, to get the dragon head down, you know, down to a pony size. But one of his secrets was he used quarter horse to help do it. Well-bred quarter horses to, to get that Mustang head down to a more of a halter horse head. Here's wee bars. Now Kootenai's wee Willie is a chapter in spots included a POA book I wrote and uh, Norm actually had wee Willie too for quite a while because he uh, he believed in racing POAs and uh, so the dragon and the dragon part on this uh, on wee bars comes from the very bottom down there uh, on the mare's side here's another son of dragon now Fearson Farms was his registered name but Norm uh, had some issues when he registered him so he always just called him son of dragon but here's a grandson of son of dragon this is more of a modern uh, product from Stevenson's. This is Dragon and Bart. Pretty modern looking POA. Now, Humby High Tiptoe, he was a famous POA. Here he is, probably as a yearling. He's related to Dragon. And uh, back a little ways, but he goes back through Dragon, through some of Norm's stuff. And... He became a champion POA. This picture was used for advertising quite a bit and on a cover of some sales, uh, regional sales magazines. He became a supreme champion stallion and he sired one of Norm's main sires, Tip O'Dragon. And Norm Stevenson had him for a long time. He wasn't named Dragon Ends, but he was at Dragon Ends for a long time. And Norm told me he got lazy in the 80s, late 70s and 80s, and he started keeping few spots. So uh, stallion, so he kind of went away from Tippo Dragon, but he did a good job for Norm. Uh, KK's Tiger Tiger, loud colored. Uh, Laura Koss rode him in POAs, a loud colored gilding. I think he became a, a great champion. He's a son of Tippo Dragon. This is another picture of Tippo Dragon. You can tell the modern build here. Of course, he's got. Uh, I got his pedigree printed out here. I'm just gonna. Sh read it a little bit. So Tippo Dragon Sire was the one we showed right here. And that's Humby High Tiptoe. He was uh, 13.1 hands. He was by Humbly D, who was by a thoroughbred named Humboldt. But Humboldt bred one of the DDs. He bred DDs Miss High Fly, a 1960. So think of that. Way back, that would have happened in the late 60s, early 70s. They took a DD Dragon, who we showed you earlier on the cover of the, the uh, newsletter, and bred a DD Dragon daughter to a 16.2 hand thoroughbred, a registered thoroughbred named Humboldt. And that got the sire to this guy right here, humbly high tiptoe. And then, of course, uh, he was bred to some Stevenson products that produced... Tippo Dragon. So I thought you pedigree people out there might enjoy some of that. Uh, people's been putting in thoroughbred and quarter horses for a long time. It's nothing new in POAs. And they had to fight the 54 inch limit. You know, now we have 14 hands. It's a little easier to do. So this is another uh, POA stallion here that became quite famous. Unfortunately, he didn't get his due. He should have. Uh, this cover, this picture was on the cover of the June 1980 magazine. That's a quarter horse mama there. But that colt became Easy to See Leo. And Easy to See Leo was one of my favorite POAs that never became famous. You know, it's kind of like what could have been. And uh, he was owned by some, some uh, very good POA breeders. Norm actually got him back. He was all Stevenson breeding, really. I mean, the quarter horse. But Norm... It introduced a lot of those bloodlines too into POAs. And uh, I believe it was the Goitz family. I might be saying their name wrong, but they had easy to see acres in Texas. And when they sold out a bunch of their stuff, they'd went to Norm to get their foundation. Well, Norm bought almost their whole herd. And one of the Colts was 
this little guy. And he grew up to be, this is a yearling picture here. Norm Stevenson consigned him to the international sale in, I believe, 81. Yep, that would have been 81, I think, or 82. He might be a two-year-old here. And he was purchased by Ray Peets, the Driftwoods uh, guy that we talked about earlier. And Ray produced some pretty good POAs by him, some pretty fast ones. There's, I know there was some uh, easy-to-see Leo gamers out there. We actually owned a daughter, easy-to-see Leo, that we really liked. And uh, anyway, Ray sold him to Max Nebergall, the East Acres gentleman, the guy that uh, named East Acres Double Tough. And Max said at one time that when he gilded him, he said, I gilded the best POA stallion I ever owned. And that was saying a lot since he owned uh, East Acres Chip a Tough, Tough to Beat, Double Tough, and, you know, quite a few others. So uh, this isn't a mature picture of him, but when he matured, he was quite a looking uh, POA stallion for the mid-80s. Here's another Dragon Inns product. I'm going to skip ahead here. This is little Kara Dembski from Wisconsin, and this is before she even owned this guy. This is Dragon Inns Willie Moon, I believe is his name. And uh, he's a Kootenai's Wee Willie uh, colt, but dragging on the bottom side. And this is when she was taking lessons, when she first started riding POAs. And then uh, Bob and Linda, her parents, bought this guy. And this is when she first started winning with him. She, uh, if you remember her riding Campbell's Birdie, that was her final POA when she aged out. And uh, she used to love bareback classes on her, too. And here she is. Just starting out in POAs, riding bareback. And then here she is with her dad, Bob, showing the versatility of POAs. And that's a Texas POA, wound up in Wisconsin. The Dragonins went all over the country. And another good example of POAs and what they can do for your family. So here's another Dragonins, and you can see the blood there, Dragonins War Dragon. So not only did he use the prefix, he put dragon in the names once in a while too, uh, Norm Stevenson. This is Lulu. Lulu ended up uh, being sold by Norm at a sale, and I believe uh, Dr. James Black bought her. I think he bought her right here that day for $1,000, and then he brought her back with, I think, a uh, smoky pants full. I believe that's her with a smoky pants full on her side. So she was a loud colored POA. And of course, uh, Smoky Pants will be a chapter in, talked about here an episode later down the road. Another Dragon Inns that Norm consigned to the sale. Norm was like a lot of breeders back then, like Puffenberger and the Stones and people at the Victors. They believed in supporting the international sale and they'd bring a trailer load every year. You know, they'd break out these young prospects and they'd bring them. Sometimes they'd, usually they'd sell them. Sometimes they'd no sell them, but they'd bring babies, yearling prospects. And also, you know, their kids would start out some of these prospects like this. Some of them became broodmares. Some went on to be sires. And usually they became gildings and for families or uh, famous show gildings even. So, uh, but they, Norm believed in supporting the sale and most of the stuff he consigned to it was related to dragon. So here's another dragon uh, relative. I believe this is a grandson. Uh, he showed up until the 80s, maybe even the 90s. This is Dragon's Talon. The Honors owned him for quite a while. There he's winning, I think, the Elroy Latch Memorial Trophy, I believe, at the Midwest. I'm pretty sure that is. There he is again, a good profile. He was one of the early, even though he's a gilding, he was an early example of the classic snow cap. And he was a short guy, but a very well put together, great representation of the breed. Here he's getting to be a little older gentleman. Melanie Hawks showing him here, I believe, in uh, Oklahoma City at the national show. But again, another pretty close up uh, relative to Dragon, Dragon's Talon, famous POA. So one of the things that helped make Dragon such a legend is a book was written about him in the early 70s and uh, it was published a couple different ways one is wild mustang and uh, originally it was called a horse called dragon 
And it was uh, penned by Lynn Hall from Iowa, who lives up in Northeast Iowa. I believe she's still alive. She became a very famous uh, author of uh, uh, young adult, basically, kids' books uh, about horses and dogs, usually animals. And uh, Follett Publishing from Chicago, Illinois, published the book. It became so famous and well-known that most of the copies you find today have a card catalog in them. You know, remember that if you're as old as me and played Oregon Trail in the early 80s, you'll remember the card in the back and you had to sign out for it with a number two pencil. If you didn't bring it back, the librarian would come into class and get you. Well, most of those dragon books are from uh, libraries like that that no longer carry it. And uh, it's just a cool, a cool story about dragon and how, you know, he became so famous i mean kids all over the country in boston chicago you know what i mean florida all over all over the country they might not have been uh horse people but they fell in love with this little spotted uh horse and of course this was fiction you know they she changed the names a little bit the hunt's name was different and everything but he came from texas and from mexico they talked she very uh, well written by Lynn Hall, how she describes the description of him and the bats biting his neck when he's a newborn baby and how he got so tough and become the leader of these Mustangs, but then how he was captured and then went up to Iowa. He actually sold at the first national POA sale in Oklahoma City, which, of course, is all fiction. The POA sale did end up in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a few years, but back in 1960 or whenever she says in the book, that was just fiction. But it's a great story, and it, it became such a popular book that it spawned three more books. New Day for Dragon, Dragon Defiant, and then the last edition was Dragon's Delight. And these are all pictures I took from my personal library. You can see on here some of the, you know, the stickers and stuff where most, I bought these probably on eBay back in the 90s and 2000s. So, but anyway... Uh, those books really helped uh, cement the legend of Dragon in, in POAs. And, uh, of course, he was inducted in the Hall of Fame in 1993, Dragon was. And uh, some statistics on him. Basically, he was, like I say, he was born in 46. In 61, the Hunts purchased him in Iowa. Uh, he passed away in Michigan, and it's kind of like uh, how he lived his whole life. You know, uh, the there was an article in the magazine about that book when it came out. From a handful of facts comes, you know, a horse called Dragon. Well, when I was writing his chapter for my book, Spots Included, I kind of laughed at that because I had to write a whole chapter, and a lot of the players that had him, the, the principals in his life, had passed away or just wasn't available for comment, and uh, it was hard to write a story about him. But... uh you know, he passed away. The story is that he broke loose in a winter snowstorm in Michigan and took a two-year-old filly with him, and they found him uh, passed away in a snowstorm on the side of by a railroad tracks, and it was believed he got hit by a train, and that was the story. But, you know, he could have just froze to death or whatever. He might have run and run. Who knows? Uh, but the thing that makes Dragon so unique is... He was only a POA for about eight years. He was alive a lot longer than that, but, you know, by the time he was captured and brought to Texas, he was already an aged stallion, and then he was only a registered POA for about eight years, and we're talking about him in 2021 on a podcast. So that's pretty cool. You know, and here's his Hall of Fame plaque that hangs in, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, at the home office, so... You know, he became a very famous POA. As I showed you tonight, I could have showed you way more examples of some of the POAs that you guys own today. There's POAs in your barn right now that still trace back to Dragon. But uh, just a cool, cool story, you know, and that's how POAs got their start. They, they had the Black Hand story, and then Siri Chief had his story about the Leopard Arabians, and then Corrit Scottish Chieftain we talked about last week being the Scottish Pony, and then Dragon from Mexico. Well, this ties in with next week's episode. We're going to be talking about the fifth school story, and I call them the five foundation POA stands, basically. And he is Stuart's Danny Boy, and he came from England. So uh, 
John Ludwig went to Canada and picked him out from uh, from a gentleman that had brought him back from England, and we'll talk more in depth about that story next week. We're going to have some good guests that knew Danny Boy personally. We'll have some great pictures again. So, again, I hope you enjoyed this show. I sped it up a little bit. I guess we were on air for almost an hour, but uh, I could use some sponsors. If you want a sponsor, it's pretty reasonable. I think the sponsors we've had so far – uh, the feedback's been good. They they seem to enjoy it. So, again, if you want to sponsor a farm or a horse or whatever, you, you know, uh, a dog, I don't care. But uh, it's just going to help out to promote this more and more, and I'll try to get it on YouTube and just promote POAs as much as I can uh, based on this history and, uh, you know, just the history of POAs. And, again, if you want to be a guest, please uh, contact me. I know people are a little scared or tentative about coming on here. Uh, it's real easy. I mean, if I can sit here and stare in the camera, of course, I'm loaded with history, but I'll lead you with pictures, and I'll ask you questions, and I won't ask you embarrassing questions. You can always just hang up the phone if you want, but uh, not really. But uh, anyway, if you, I know there's people out there with a lot of great stories. We may get David that I talked about earlier down the road, and... Uh, we have a lot of topics to cover, so this summer should be pretty cool. And uh, talking about POA history all summer, I'm going to be live at the international or the Congress, excuse me, the Congress in Tulsa. I'm going to be there most of the week, and I'm going to do some try to do some recorded interviews and probably go live that Tuesday because the show will be going on. So and cover some stuff that's that's happening with that show. So uh, again, I want to thank you for watching my POA podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. I'm Kent Rourke. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your week. See you next Tuesday.